Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal, boys and girls. My name is Ty Hildebrandt. Joining me over there, fine gentleman, you know him as Dan Rubenstein. Dan and I, we run a little show called... Um, It'll come to me, Dan. What is this called? Well, I would I would hope that everybody knows the name of the show. They've already clicked on it. Right. Uh, it's the Solid Verbal time. The Solid Verbal. You can find us yeah. at solidverbal.com. Also out on iTunes.com slash Solid Verbal or Apple Podcasts if you want to have the proper nomenclature. We are yes. also on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and everywhere you can find fine social media. Sir, how are you? I'm good. I feel like you're having a day. Yeah, it's been a long day for me, Dan. Okay. Long day of meetings, a long day of uh corporate America. So I'm a little bit I'm a little bit of a, a brain drain state right now. That's good. I love that because I know you've had this show, not unlike fans looking at the fall schedule, the football slate. They got that that week circled. Like, ooh, mm. when we go to to X state, X tech, that's the game. Right. I feel like we've had this, or at least you have, have had this topic. We're doing a Q&A show. We've got a ton of college football questions. Don't worry. It's still, at least in name, a college football show. But we also have bathroom etiquette questions, Uh-oh. which I would venture to say, and I will stress this, Ty, bathroom etiquette, not procedure. Right. Correct. We, we had Correct. some people write in and say, like, should I wipe standing up or sitting down? I was like, you know what? That's a you thing. Follow your bliss. I can't tell you the right or wrong answer. But etiquette wise, Ty and I have strong thoughts. But you in particular, this is this is not just a a professional endeavor for you. Right. This is a this is a personal passion. It's sort of like my life's work, you could say. You love space, you love bathroom etiquette, and I the the forever search for a full night's sleep. Correct. There are other oddball subjects in there. No. Uh, right. Yes, the subject has been something I've observed mm-hmm. uh, in my professional life, in my personal life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we'll we'll try to get into it without getting a lot into of questions any, into any lore details. Yeah, we should point out we decided, eh, we'll throw it out there to people, mm-hmm. ask us some questions. We receive more questions on this subject. It, it, for lack of a better term, because this is a bathroom etiquette show, it binds us, Ty. Don't forget, you can write a review for the show. I saw some, <laughs> folks, some folks out there saying, uh, well, yeah, we like the show, but they talk a little bit too much about themselves, too much personal life stuff. It is May. This is what we do. This is a show about ourselves, and we get sidetracked into college football. We promise to get to more college football fair criticism, but we're going to start with college football here this evening. And then we will see where the conversation takes us, if that is fine with you, Dan. I know where it's going, Ty. It's going down that drain, quite literally and figuratively. Congratulations, Skippy. You've got mail. You've got mail. On the solid verbal. Dan, as often as we can, we like to play that age-old sound, one of the lone holdovers from our early days back in 2008. A bygone era. We like to pay homage, Dan. (sighs) To those folks who write in via email, via Twitter, Facebook, what have you, Messenger Pigeon. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, we decide to ask for football and some other college football or not college football (laughs) related questions. Why don't we start with the college football? I think that's a good direction. That is all the same to you. Let's go to John. John Tucker, Dan. John Tucker must die. He said, who is the next Bill Snyder? Okay. How do you take that interpretation? How do you take that question? What does that mean to you? Who's the next coach of Kansas State or who's the next legendary coach to retire and come back? That's how I took it. I was I was thinking more along the lines of the latter, yeah. maybe with a weird twist of an age-old starter jacket. I don't know if you're going to find a whole lot of coaches who retire and come back. That's, that's right. almost impossible to predict, but... I kind of thought of it more broadly in the sense of which coaches are currently in a role that I could see them being in forever. Well, okay. That's more of a paterno. I'm going to say like in a role 
they maybe move on to another level. Maybe they go up to the NFL and maybe they're fired. Maybe they just decide it's not for them and they're more of a, like a Saban situation. They're more of a college type and return to the place that helped to build that reputation. So not unlike, and this would be an example, Bobby Petrino at Louisville. Right. Sort of realized NFL wasn't for him, got into trouble at Arkansas, returned to the place that helped to build him. I'm not going to say he is going to be thought of as fondly as... Uh, as Bill Snyder is in Manhattan, but I'm I'm going to say that return to past glory, sexy Randy Edsel. Right. For so example. let me let me ask you this then. Yeah. If Lane Kiffin were to somehow in a weird alternate universe be rehired by Tennessee or USC, would that count? No, because he left on acrimonious terms. So did Bobby Petrino from Louisville. I think it was, okay, maybe it was acrimonious in that, like, you're losing this guy who's been so good for your program, but he was advancing to the NFL at that point. Okay. It was an understandable, it's not, we hate Bobby Petrino because he left us for the Falcons. Like, if you were to leave your job for, like, a higher class gentleman's club. Right, okay. Your current job couldn't say, well, this doesn't make sense. Right. Um, So here's what I have. And stop me if you have the same thing. Uh, legendary Cincinnati coach Brian Kelly returns to his glory. Maybe he takes a shot with the who, the Vikings in three years okay, and doesn't work out. He's a legend and unfinished business like the Sugar Bowl that he abandoned his team right, okay. in. Um, sexy Randy Etzel obviously has the opportunity right now. I mean, taking UConn to a Fiesta Bowl now appears to be more significant than it perhaps seemed at the time. Um, Robert Davey at Notre Dame. Okay. And with Wisconsin and Barry Alvarez like 30 <laughs> yards from the head coach's office. It's always on the table, Ty. Yeah, what about Tom Herman? Long term. Um cuz if Tom Herman, if Tom Herman has any degree of success in rebuilding Texas, right. He is clearly going to get a call from the NFL. Okay. And if that doesn't work out, you have to believe that if Texas needs a guy, they'd go back to the Herman well. Because he started his career there. Clearly, at that point, he he will have some credibility within Longhorn Nation. I could see prospectively him being an interesting name for this. So that's that's two steps. You're looking at two steps. So he has not, you know, he's only built his legend basically at Houston. He was only there a couple years. So I don't feel like so Bill Snyder's first go round at Kansas State was 16 or 17 years, 1989 to 2005, came back in 2009 when it was clear that the Wildcats needed his help. So I would imagine Tom Herman would have to be at Texas for a while to compare it to a Bill Snyder situation. What about Chip Kelly going back to Oregon? So that seemed like it was on the table, and that would have fit it um, slightly different circumstances than Bill Snyder and Kansas State. But yes, realizing that perhaps his speed was more Eugene, Oregon than Philadelphia or San Francisco in the NFL would have been a cousin to the Bill Snyder situation. Good question here from John Tucker. Next. John. No, Josh. Excuse me. Josh. How about some Big Ten West talk? Hell yeah. Yeah. How about some Big Ten West talk? Um, We do have a soundtrack for this, Dan. Yeah, I want to spice this Big Ten West talk up. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. What are Northwestern's chances to win the division? How about Purdue's timetable for success with Jeff Brom at the helm? Is his offense going to change the league like Joe Tiller in the 90s? Yeah, yeah. Um, So... Here's how I see the Big Ten West at the moment. Wisconsin is probably still in the best overall shape, even though they're on their, what, it's third defensive coordinator in three years? Yes, and agreed. Lost some big names on defense. TJ Watt uh, was a first-round pick. I think he went to the Steelers. I could Also, be wrong. did you know J.J. Watt's brother? I did. I did just find that out this morning. Yeah. What a crazy world in which we live. Uh, experience back at running back. They got a couple pieces to fill in on the offensive line. Your boy, Alex Hornibrook, is full-time now. Yep. Quarterback. So I think Wisconsin's still in the best position. It appears they miss Ohio State, and they get Michigan and Iowa at home. Uh, it's, a, it's a good time to have a nice schedule in the Big Ten West. Um, Iowa, new quarterback. Uh, Brian Ferentz is now the offensive coordinator. Okay. So, you know, that Ferentz family, they're going to open things up on offense. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nebraska will be starting a kind of below average Tulane QB. 
Uh, so get excited about that. Bob Diaco. Sort Great of head that, of hair. Great head of hair. That 3-4. Uh, Nebraska replaces pretty much everybody other than the very fast and sometimes injured DeMornay Pearsonell. Um, and also a really, really good name on Nebraska's defense. His first name is Freedom. I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce his last name. But he's an edge rusher for Nebraska. And his name is Freedom. Uh, you have P.J. Fleck. You have Purdue with uh, with Jeff Brom. So two new head coaches there. So Minnesota has a lot of work to do. Rob Smith, you may remember Rob Smith yeah. from his time giving up every single yard at Arkansas last year. Right, right. Um, and Northwestern, it's a really good time. In all seriousness, Ty, it is a really good time to have a steady program. Well, here here's the thing. You mentioned that, and you're right. I think Northwestern, the question here is, what are their chances to win the division? They probably have as good a chance as anyone outside of Wisconsin mm-hmm. because they bring back Clayton Thorson, who I yep. know we both like. Justin Jackson yeah. had a huge bowl game. The question will be, what do they what do they put around those two guys from a playmaker standpoint? Mm-hmm. Can they block for them? But they do bring back a very talented defense that should help them. In the Big Ten West. You look at the schedule. I mean, there are some landmines on there, but... No Michigan or Ohio State, though. No Michigan or or Ohio State. So they're set up pretty well if they want to make a run, if they can get it together early enough. The meat of their schedule is Wisconsin on the road, followed Mm -hmm. by Penn State. And that's relatively early in the season, so we'll get a better idea of where the Wildcats stand as far as that goes. But I like Northwestern. Purdue, I like moving forward, but they've got holes all across the field. Yeah. While I do think Jeff Brom will build them up, it's going to take time. So on our Coach Hire podcast, weird show that we did a couple weeks ago, one of the things that I think Stephen Godfrey mentioned was the most important hire is the coordinator on the side of the ball in which the coach is not used right. to, or not his Correct. background specifically. Sure. So uh, Jeff Brom brings over one of my all-time favorite defensive coordinators and Nick Holtz from Western Kentucky. You may remember him. I think Pete Carroll had hired him at USC, spent some time at Idaho as their head coach, has been around. And Nick Holtz at Western, Western Kentucky, the S&P Plus defense went from 118 to 60 to 42 the past three years. And that includes a jump in one year from the first to second year of 117 to 25 against the pass, pass efficiency defense against the conference teams. So there is a track record of defensive improvement from year one to year two. Year one is just establishing culture, scheme, playbook, getting to know what you need to fill in. Purdue is not going to do all that much beyond, I think, have some fun nuggets this year. But I would not expect a ton in 2017. Northwestern, when I look at the Big Ten West, I don't know if you want to play the medal again. Uh, there we go. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Northwestern may have the best and most proven backfield. Is that weird to say? It's in, a the, weird. in the division. I'm a little uncomfortable with that. So You're right. Clayton Thorson last year finished third in the Big Ten in efficiency as a quarterback, ahead of JT Barrett, ahead of CJ Beathard, ahead of Alex Hornibrook, Tommy Armstrong, Mitch Leiner, all these people. He had a good year. Justin Jackson's been there for 17 years. He's going to rush for a million yards if he stays healthy. And here's the big thing with Northwestern that we have not even mentioned yet. They're coming off of an enormous pinstripe bowl victory time. Mm, yes, they are. Cannot overstate the importance of that pinstripe bowl win. So I think the Big Ten West will go as follows. Top three, Wisconsin, Northwestern, Iowa. Moving on, let's go to Ryan. He says, would you rather Danny Etling or June arriving Malik Zaire to run Matt Canada's offense at LSU in 2017? I think Zaire. I think the ceiling is higher. I think we have a concept for Danny Etling's ceiling. That said, I think Matt Canada is very good at finding wrinkles and the best position for his quarterbacks and offense. You saw that last year with the blending of some spread concepts and power with James Conner at Pitt. I feel as if, I don't know why I need to preface it with I feel, It seems as if LSU, with an experienced offensive line, intriguing skill talent, a legitimately great running back, if not one of the best in the country already, uh, it seems as if Malik Zaire gives them an element if he can stay healthy and if Matt Canada can put him in position to complete, completable throws for him, that the offense will have a higher ceiling with Zaire. So I would go go in that direction if he is as advertised. Yeah, I mean, LSU has had mobile quarterbacks who could scramble but couldn't necessarily throw. Zaire can throw. Zaire can throw. Last year might not have been 
the absolute most representative sample of what he has to offer on the football field. But dude can throw, and he can certainly run. So absolutely, higher ceiling for Malik Zaire. Like you said, you already have a baseline for Danny Etling. You know what you're getting there. With Matt Canada, I think Malik Zaire would be a much better option. Yeah, I think what it'll come down to, especially when Zaire gets to campus, is who picks up the verbiage, who is just more comfortable running the the sort of skeleton of that offense. All right. Uh, Santos be free. Santos. If Oregon played Notre Dame in a future championship game, which of you would take the loss better? And would you be Mm -hmm. friends afterwards? Yeah. This is an interesting question. Yeah, so you you have recently fallen asleep while yes. watching a Notre Dame National Championship game. I have. I would be outwardly more upset. You Really? I would. You would probably be a little more tranquil on the surface but more passive aggressive later. That's my read yeah. on the situation. Yeah, I would shut down. Having if having to watch what three national championship losses in say a 10 year span. If this happened in the next couple of years, that'd be rough Ty. That'd be rough. It, it takes me a little bit. You were sort of resigned and made peace with it pretty quickly. The thing about it is that people don't realize neither one of us is really a trash talker. That's true. I'm much more passive aggressive with the, uh, the music and the elderly audience for Notre Dame football. Okay. But we don't necessarily have a trash talking, not to each other. Not yes. to each other. We we put on a good show here. but mm-hmm. So from that standpoint, there wouldn't necessarily be a very obvious reason to be mad at that person. It would be more directed at our teams or their opponents. But, right. Um, so yeah, I, I think friends afterwards is be, would be in order. Yeah, absolutely. Or at least friendly acquaintances. I don't know about this sub question here. Do you oh, you don't so? you don't like that sub question? No, you can ask it, but I'm I'm just. Alec wants it. to know: Has Ty been antagonistic towards Oregon lately? Am I just being sensitive? You're probably just being sensitive, which is okay. That's part of being a fan. But in fairness, Dan, mm-hmm. I have taken a lot of crap <laughs> it's true. after the fantasy thing show and after the yeah. secret garbage bracket. Mm-hmm. People have really have really come at me, and I'm a big boy. I can take the criticism, right? But there seems to be an assertion out there that I am just a, a giant beta male, unable to hold my <laughs> ground against you. Oh, Ty. Well, I think it also hurts that everybody loved the Notre Dame 4-8 and thing and Oregon went 4-8 and, and everybody just sort of glossed over that and, and turned their collective attention to Notre Dame's record. What people don't realize is that you're so insistent that eventually I have to give, otherwise our show is going to be four hours. That's true. Okay. I'm relentless. You're Relentless. But I have maybe been a little bit more antagonistic towards Oregon. That's okay. We'll see what happens during the season. Kenneth, right? He writes in, which Arizona school will, will have a better season, Dan? Shout out to the Territorial Cup, Ty. That's right. Uh, Arizona and Arizona State are the two yeah. most obvious choices here. Do you have a strong lean? Probably Arizona, yeah. but I'm worried about that defense. I don't Arizona State's overhauling everything. They've got two new coordinators. The Blake Barnett edition is interesting, uh, but they are philosophically just overhauling everything. And Arizona State, since they went, what, three years ago now to the, the Pac-12 championship game, they've been kind of secret garbage. Yeah, They have not been good, as well as Todd Graham has coached this team early on. Whereas with Arizona, I think there is there is something with the Wildcats that I feel better about than I do about anything with Arizona State, and that's some sort of combination of Brandon Dawkins, Khalil Tate. Now, they have a 26-year-old quarterback, Donovan Tate, I believe his name is. Okay. Um, was a minor league baseball player, drafted, now is coming back to college. And they've got a really fun running back duo that was has been beat up constantly. But if they're healthy, they can cover up for some offensive deficiencies, J.J. Taylor and Nick Wilson. So there's sneaky danger for Arizona and secret garbage for Arizona State. So I'm going to go with Arizona, not confidently, but Arizona at the moment. Things aren't great. I tend to agree. Yeah. Moving on. Next question. Lee writes in with a very interesting question. Yes. Uh, And we actually got a bunch of questions as it relates to college football quarterbacks. Mm Mm-hmm. Lee says, is this year really the quote-unquote year of the quarterback in college football? 
And can we expect a slight shift towards the pro norm, pro style right. NFL quarterback in Sam Darnold, Josh Allen, Josh Rosen, et cetera, et cetera. I uh, got a couple questions about Sam Darnold. Uh, Kyle writes in, is there too much hype for him? He was second best quarterback on his team a year ago. Now he's second on a Heisman list. We also got a question from Blaine who wants to know a few under the radar quarterbacks other than the obvious ones who could have a really strong impact in 2017. So a bunch of quarterback related questions. My comment on the year of the quarterback, the year of the pro style quarterback, I don't know if there's going to be any great movement afoot in college football towards any pro style systems. My hunch is no. I just think we're kind of entering a chapter right. where the better quarterbacks in college football happen to be pro style. Does that seem fair to you to say? I think that's right. And the term pro style is such a loose catch all for things that aren't super defined in college because USC will run the zone read with Sam Darnold. They run a, they run RPO stuff with Sam Darnold. Same for Josh Rosen and UCLA. Trace McSorley runs a ton of RPO and spread concepts at Penn State, even though he is super productive and getting Heisman Trophy attention at this point. So it's hard to sort of... Right. Unless you're looking at maybe Stanford, and even they run shotgun spread option running stuff with certain quarterbacks. Recently, Kevin Hogan ran a bunch of that. Andrew Luck ran some of that. Even pro so, style isn't pro style anymore. Right, exactly. And as we see more and more quarterbacks and offenses in the NFL sort of introduce all sorts of different concepts to their repertoires, I think it's hard to define anything as pro style and spread. That said, under the radar quarterbacks at this point, yeah. uh, I think Josh Allen is going to continue to get a ton of attention for Wyoming. Oh, yeah. And they play Oregon and uh, somebody else of significance uh, early on in the season. I want to say... God, it's not Wisconsin. I think it's one of the Big Ten teams I was looking up. I think I think oh, it's, they play Iowa early on, so he'll have an opportunity early on to uh, make some sort of statement in either direction. Um, I think Will Greer is an interesting name. I have Will Greer down on mine as well. Yeah. I also have Eric Dungy. Okay, a little slight maybe. Yeah, I don't know if he's so much under the radar, but right. he does play for Syracuse, and it yeah. will be year two of the Dino Babers offense which we know is pretty potent. So he's a name that you can get used to hearing more of and probably Mm -hmm. won't be on that headline, but is going to put up some sick numbers. Uh, Both quarterbacks in the state of Washington put up and have put up ridiculous numbers. You know, Jake Browning didn't end the season super well with the games against Colorado, USC, and of course, Alabama. Luke Falk has been there forever. And I I think will receive attention because he is really, he stands in and he's a warrior. I know he plays in the air raid, but he has a nice arm and he will just he will deserve attention throughout this season. Jake Browning is not under the radar, but he is a name that perhaps isn't garnering NFL attention in the way that Sam Darnold and Josh Rosen have been, but he throws a hell of a ball. Also kind of small, though. Um, Outside of that, uh, curious about Shane Bichel in an offense that was very productive these past couple years. Speaking of slight. Ooh, I got one more name. I have one more name that could find himself into a very productive... We we know about Baker Mayfield. He's not under the radar. He's been a playoff quarterback. Mason Rudolph, same state, has junkyard Jim Washington. Is he under the radar? He's under the radar because he plays in a state with Baker Mayfield, who has, I think, received the lion's share of the attention in that area. Okay. I don't know if I but fully subscribe to that. I would I say Mason say. Mason Rudolph just because Oklahoma State has not been in big national conversations uh, as much as perhaps they should have because eh, probably because of the defense. All right. Agree to disagree on that one. I want to go to Sam Darnold though. Kyle Please. Kyle wrote in and uh, this was a question about him being the second best quarterback on his team last year. Now he's like second on the Heisman preseason mm-hmm. Heisman list. Has the hype gone too far? I don't think so at all. I think he's really good. If he I'm is. if I'm an NFL fan and my team has an opportunity to get him, I want Sam Darnold. I'm very excited to see what he can do this year. No, I'm with you. And the the part of the comment early on, second best quarterback on his team, I don't think it's totally accurate. I imagine Max Brown had been in the program for a while and the first game was against Alabama in it was in Jerry World, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I just at a certain point, I think the USC coaches said it might hurt Sam Darnold long-term to just throw him against the wolves 
uh, against Alabama as his first start in an NFL stadium. We're not expecting all that much from this year, so why don't we ease in and see where we are in a few games? Because I think in fall camp, reports were coming out that Sam Darnold was more talented than Max Brown, but he was a redshirt freshman and didn't have the experience in the program, so they just they went with the experience early on, not unlike what happened with, I want to say it was Cole Stroud and Deshaun Watson. Yeah, right, right. Against Georgia, I imagine Clemson coaches in practice said, Yes, Deshaun Watson is clearly more special than Cole Stroud, but that's okay. We'll see what happens against Georgia and we'll work him in at an appropriate pace. I think that was more the thinking than he was the clear second best. All right. Uh, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six or seven questions. We here can do before. as many as these as you want, Ty. I want to rifle through the college football ones if we could. Please. Very quickly, Matt, which two Power Five teams in the same conference? or rivals would be mm. the best and worst pairing for a Love couple's, this question. couple's marriage. So, okay, you're about to get married in what? Three weeks? Yes. It's coming up on us here. Um, Less than three weeks. Yeah. Do you have any, any thoughts on this question? So I think if you're talking about fan bases that, you know, sort of oil and water, whatever, um, you have to stay away from perhaps... Schools with families mixing in only there's a the one game in town in that state in that area. So like Michigan, Michigan State, a lot of people within the same family are attending both of those schools. That becomes troublesome. South Carolina, Clemson, Ole Miss, Mississippi State, Oregon, Oregon State. I think people look at the Michigan, Ohio State rivalry or Oregon, Washington as super fierce and above all. But I don't think there's as much familial mixing. Okay. So I think that's I think the the same state thing where there's not a lot else, lot not a lot else going on. That's the worst. I think for the best, maybe common enemies, maybe like an Auburn, Tennessee. They both hate Bama. Michigan State, Ohio State. The enemy of Michigan. the enemy is your spouse. I exactly. Okay. Oklahoma, Texas Tech. That kind of thing. Yeah, I was gonna say I, I would stay away from rivals or any kind of intra SEC type mm-hmm. stuff because the SEC always roots for the SEC. Right. You know, so maybe that's the answer for the best. All right, Mike, which new coach will see the most success in their first year with their new team? Which will see the least amount of success? Is Tom Oof. Herman too obvious an answer at Texas? For most? Yeah, I mean, because any success at all, any forward sure. progress, I think, is going to be viewed very positively. Well, I Charlie Strong at USF could have a hell of a year. Right, Quentin Flowers, sure. With with how much they return there. Uh, new coach-wise, I like Texas just because I think Charlie Strong recruited well enough and there are enough interesting pieces there. P.J. Fleck is going to move the needle, and I think that will be viewed as success. I guess it, de- it depends on how you define that. Um, in terms of actually driving interest to a program, P.J. Fleck will be successful in that regard, sure. Matt Rule might have a really long year. Yeah, wake up. Matt Rule, I, I was going to say, is probably the obvious answer for at least. Yeah, I mean, Jeff Brom, Matt Rule, if we're just looking at Power 5 schools, yeah, I don't think it's going to be great there. All right. Uh, Joe wants to know, can you give me the best case, worst case scenario Mm. For the Maryland Terrapins in 2017, I'm sure Joe is aware of this, but Maryland is replacing pretty much everybody. They need help yeah. across the board, new quarterback situation. So I think I think the best case scenario is is twofold. First off, if you can get to a bowl game, I think that's an accomplishment. Yeah, that's an accomplishment because the Big Ten East is going to be pretty tough again. Got to one last year. Yeah, got to one last year. If you can do it again this year, I think that's that's good. I think what you really need to see is development from a player standpoint. Some guys that you can hang your hat on for 2018. Not to give too morbid an outlook here, but I think DJ Durkin is doing a really good job. He certainly brought in plenty of coaching talent to help mold that program. Man, it's tough to find five wins on here. It's real tough. It is real tough. They have Towson. UCF is improving. They go to Minnesota, to Ohio State, to Wisconsin, to Michigan State. And luckily, they are a team that will get Rutgers every year. They have Indiana, changing Indiana a little bit. They have Penn State to finish out the year. I man, I don't see five wins here. Yeah. 
That's rough. Texas I, and UCF in the non-con is just... I don't think a bowl is probable because of all they have to replace. Right. But again, if you can hang... They've been your, recruiting well. Right, exactly. If you can hang your hat on some new ammo coming in on mm-hmm. the recruiting side, if you can see a few names on defense that develop and can give you reason for excitement as you move forward, I think that I think that right now is what you have to hang your hat on. So if we did the drive for six for Illinois, I want the path to danger five. From path Maryland. to danger five. Like at very, they've won a very dangerous, they're a dangerous five win team. Like any given week, they could be weird. That's what they need to aspire to this year, probably. Let's go to John. He says, uh, pretend you're 6'5", 220. You've got poster mm-hmm. boy good looks. Yeah. Don't we all? Mm-hmm. You're also the number one quarterback in the 2018 class. Rumor has it that some NFL teams are already salivating over you. Hell yeah. Which program, spelled in the British way, with the mm-hmm. two M's and the E at the end, are you committing to, Dan? We've had this question. Yeah, we've not in a while, but... Several times in the past. Mm-hmm. I've always answered Georgia. I know you have. Georgia's been my my go-to answer here. But I I think if you're 6'5", number one quarterback, you are entering college under the assumption that uh, you're going to go on to the NFL. Mm -hmm. I might have to amend that answer and go Mark Richt at Miami. Okay. Because we know he can develop quarterbacks. I think that's what you're going for. If you've got the poster boy good looks, maybe you... Maybe you're looking for a place where you can be big man on campus. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Miami's an interesting place for that kind of mentality as well. So mm-hmm. let's uh, let's change the answer. Let's go Miami. Uh, I'm, I'm taking Stanford and I'm not thinking twice. Okay. You're in California. You're going to have a really good offensive line in front of you. You're not going to have a ton of top NFL type talent at on the defensive line that you're seeing, defensive back that you're seeing. You'll have a good running game. Worst case scenario, you're at Stanford. You blow out your knee. You're getting a Stanford education. Diggity Dog writes in. Hit me. Why are there such few Pac-12 versus SEC Mm. or Pac-12 versus ACC non-conference bowl matchups? And what can be done to change this, Dan? Yeah. Um... I would assume there are not a ton of these matchups because where are you going to have them? You want Pac-12 and SEC fans to travel, and West Coast is far away, Ty. You know this only having been to the West Coast two or three times, right? That's correct, yeah. It's a far away place, and I, I understand the attraction of going to like Pasadena or San Diego, but still... That's a, if you're coming from Athens, if you're coming from Knoxville, if you're coming from Columbia, that's a ways. And what's in between, I don't know if it's an attractive New Year's-ish destination if you're trying to go exactly in between. You're not going to hold a bowl game in Little Rock. You're not going to hold a bowl game in Houston. In that that's going to attract people from Seattle. So I think it's geography. I honestly do. Yeah. And there probably isn't all that much more to it. That That's just... Unless you're playing in the Rose Bowl, why would... And especially, the SEC and ACC country is pretty warm, even in the winter. So coming out west to play a bowl game in San Francisco or Portland or wherever, it's not that attractive. Why? All right. You're comfortable. This next gentleman who writes in, Mm -hmm. do you think this is his real name? I don't think it is. He goes by the name Owl. Mm Mm-hmm. What is a venue you have not yet visited that you would like to see a game in? He does not specify college football. If it's non-college football, the answer for me is Wimbledon. Yeah, I I was going to say something across the pond, but Mm -hmm. if we are assuming college football, I'd love to see Neyland Stadium. Yeah. Visit the Vol Navy. I'm not sure I'd be crazy about hearing Rocky Top every every other minute, but... uh, Neyland Stadium would be pretty damn cool. I've not been yet. You know where it might be? It might be Norman. It might be at. Uh, okay. It might be going to see an Oklahoma game, either, just because it's a huge, huge program, and I haven't been there. Either Norman or Fordham, obviously. Or for obviously that always goes without saying. All right, and finally, before we drastically shift gears here, yes, Curtis, longtime listener, Curtis writes in. He says you've gone the indie and semi indie route. Mm -hmm. in covering the national championship on site. Do you have any tips or pitfalls 
to avoid if one is thinking of heading down in 2018 to Atlanta? I would see to me, I would avoid everything that has to do with the game until the game. Right. I would avoid the concerts and the open media days. or You can pay to go to media days, whatever. I would avoid all of the lead up stuff because it's just sort of corporate and stale. Not that exciting to me. Because right. that's you can do that in any city. What I would do specifically, and this is specific to Atlanta, is personally, I'm super interested in food. So oh, I would try boy. to go to as many different neighborhoods as possible and get, eat as well as I possibly could locally. Or just like take in a city. See what's awesome in the city. If it's an aquarium, if it's like a running the steps to the Rocky statue. I use food as my sort of guide, but figure out what and excites you about life. If you like running in parks, find out where, where the best running trail is in Atlanta. Do that. Find some good Facebook groups. Find some... Uh, Facebook groups? Well, I'm not talking like furries or anything. I'm saying find people who are going to the game, fans of whatever team are playing in said game. Mm -hmm. Go on the Reddit, the subreddit for college football. There are always a lot of great fans on there and see what, see what other like-minded fans are up to. Because you'll find that there are a lot of college football fans who just go to these types of things and sure. may not have a rooting interest. So I would start there. All right. Fair enough. Um, I just go eat, go eat at Heirloom Barbecue. It's wonderful. It's great barbecue in Atlanta with like a Korean touch. Before we move on, I did want to mention springtime is a great time to hit the reset button, Dan. Yeah. And uh, you can retackle your personal goals. Mm -hmm. Like getting fit. Cleaning, cooking, maybe getting married if, I don't know, you're interested in such if things. If one were to, yeah. Luckily, Dan, Blue Apron, they make it incredible mm -hmm. and incredibly easy to home cook a meal. It's easy, accessible. They deliver seasonal recipes with step-by-step -step instructions and pre-portioned ingredients right to your door for less than mm -hmm. 10 bucks a meal. You can even customize your recipes based on your preferences and select a delivery option that's right for you. I know you're a very picky eater. Yeah. Plus, there's no weekly commitment. You can only get the deliveries you want when you want them, if you're interested in that. Here's what is featured. <clears throat> Here we go. Um, some of the meals available in May include beef teriyaki. I've not pre-screened these, so there's a good chance okay. I'm going to... I'm ready. I'm going to botch it, but... Uh, Beef teriyaki stir fry with sugar, snap peas, and lime rice. I got that. You, you nailed it. Baked spinach and egg flatbread with sautéed asparagus and lemon aioli. Two for two. Three cheese and baby broccoli stromboli with tomato and oregano dipping sauce. Mm -hmm. And finally, crispy salmon and roasted potato salad with pickled mustard seeds and creme, oh boy, uh, frake uh. sauce. <laughs> F R A I C H E. I C H E. Yeah, creme fresh. We've both gotten Blue Apron. We love it. Mm -hmm. I know you got some. Have you cooked it yet? I have cooked it and it was delicious. It was a some sort of like grilled pork with a mustard sauce. Straightforward, easy. Yeah. You can control the ingredients. Got some wonton noodles for later in this week, actually. And there's a tandoori chicken recipe that looks it looks hearty, Ty, without being super unhealthy. It looked it's I'm excited for this, Ty. I'm ready. Check out the menu and get your first three meals for free with free shipping by going mm -hmm. to blueapron.com slash solid S O L I D. Do it. You Cram will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait again. Blueapron.com slash solid three free meals with free shipping. Cram Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Cram Frank? Sure. <laughs> Speaking of food now, we're going to go the other end. Awkward transition. Boom. Where are we going? Talk to me. So we asked for bathroom etiquette questions because you have lots of strong thoughts. I do. Yeah. And I found out I have strong thoughts. So we solicited these questions. We got these questions. First off, a couple of people mentioned this to us. Did you see Tom Herman's guide to peeing? Yeah, I saw that. And hydration. I saw. It's very weird. Very do you, weird. Do you yourself, Ty, because there are no secrets between us, Right? do you take hydration and peeing seriously? Uh, do I take it seriously? As a basic human function, yes, of course. Who doesn't? Uh, a lot of... Well, obviously, if you are... So, we should explain. 
Tom Herman, head coach of Texas, has put up these laminated signs above, I would assume, urinals and toilets in the Texas facility. Very weird. Um, Just very, very weird behavior. I dig this. I think it's wonderful. And it's basically different shades of, I guess, clear to orange, burnt orange, I suppose, um, of championship level hydration levels next to shades that are like white and very faintly yellow, selfish teammate, deeply yellow, and then more gold and light orange is associated with, and I quote, blatant disregard for your teammates. You are headed to area 51. Okay. that it, See, here's the thing about bathrooms in general. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if you're in a public facility. I don't care if you're at a work facility. What I've found is that people in bathrooms, you learn a lot about them. Um, Presumably, you're not in the stall with them. But just in general, watching people just go about their uh, business, you find out which people were raised by wolves and which were not. Right. And so this to me is just you see weird stuff going on in there in the hydration chart while kind of funny, is just weird to me. Excessively weird to me. If you give me an opportunity to take pride in my hydration and color code it, I'm all about it. I love it. Strong disagree. We we got several different buckets of, of <laughs> questions here, okay? We did. And again, should we stress, etiquette, not procedure. Right. The first big general category we, we got mm-hmm. was summed up, I thought, pretty well by Michael. Who wanted to know, is it okay for someone to see someone using the stall and to talk to them? This whole topic around bathroom conversations. Or speaking in general, like on the phone, perhaps, dialing into a conference call while you're sitting on the john. Yeah. So bathroom etiquette as it relates to conversation. Do you have strong thoughts on this topic, Dan? Sink, totally fair game as you're washing hands, I think. Yeah. Um. If you are friends with a person and like you walk into the bathroom sort of together, incidentally, and you head towards the urinal, friend heads towards the stall, and you want to say something like, hey, good luck in there. I think that's fine. But once the door is closed, that's their office. That is their business. And you you let them to it. But if you've got a great goof, that's where the exception is tied to me. I would say no conversation, though. No, like, hey, should I expect the file by three or none of that? I've already been in the situation where just as kind of a random passerby washing my hands, going for the retuck of the shirt, uh, I've witnessed two gentlemen, um, not actually witnessed, but heard two gentlemen in adjacent stalls having a full on business discussion. That's so odd. It struck me as odd, too. It's the holiest of places, no pun intended. I've also been in the stall listening to a business pep talk occur (sighs) on the outside of the wall. (sighs) I'm not with it. In general, pleasantries can be exchanged. But Mm -hmm. the full-on conversation, the cell phone, if you hear a cell phone conversation going on in there, just flush. Right. Make as much noise as you can. Um, We've conducted interviews here with Houston Nutt where presumably he was in the bathroom. May have been his own private bathroom. May have been his own private bathroom, in which case, okay, fine. Mm-hmm. But if, in fact, you hear an associate in the restroom talking on the cell phone, I don't care how important the call is, initiate the flush. Let him know who's boss. Right. I would also ask, uh, and then perhaps we can move on to a uh, related subject. Mm-hmm. Have you ever been in a situation where someone's walked into a bathroom, saw you maybe for the first time in a while, and offered, offered their hand to, to shake your hand? No, I've never gotten like a, hey, what's up, dude? Long time. Never Um, for like a hand, even a fist bump. No. See, I've already been walking out of the bathroom (sighs) and I've seen someone walking in that I hadn't seen in a while. Mm -hmm. And curiously enough, that gentleman put his hand out. Hey, how are you? I'm fine. I'm curious how you're going to be after I shake your hand here. Yeah, I would just sort of give you like the sort of like hand, like show the hands, be like, hey, sorry, just wash my hands. Do you go with the gear shift? The gear shift and try and go fist pound. No, I'll pull my hands back. I'll just be like, ah, uh, it just was in the bathroom. Um, Very odd circumstances, but I'm generally no on talking, no on the uh, on the cellular conversation. I'm okay with texting if you can do it discreetly. Will you play a game on your phone? Uh, I have played a game on the phone, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. yeah, I think that's that's fine for bathroom time. And when I say goof, by the way, uh, our our pal Will here at SB Nation claims, and I really hope it's true because it's so wonderful that if he is in the bathroom and he's using the urinal and somebody else is in the stall and they have a a louder <laughs> experience, okay, right in the stall, Will will. While he's right next to the stall, peeing at the urinal, go, I'll have what he's having. Okay. That's and that's just... wonderful. That's wonderful. Because <laughs> it makes the person so uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. What is what is our next sort of bucket item? This one I thought was borderline brilliant and not the easiest to answer. This comes from I, Tiger Tiger. I don't know how that's what his name is on or okay. her name on yeah. uh, on Twitter. How inappropriate would it be to bring your own toilet paper? Wow. The in-laws have thick toilet paper. So multiple ply, I'm guessing what he means by that. But weak toilets. Okay. Wife and I average about one and a half clogs per visit. Wow. That so might be grounds two, for a new house. Yeah. I mean, some places the plumbing just is not great or the toilets are low flow, whatever it is. Uh, bring your own TP is definitely an option. If they're like on triple ply and you could bring one and a half ply one, you know, if you can take one ply, I don't recommend it. But, but here's, here's the thing though. Yeah. A one and a half average indicates there have been somewhere there have yeah. been maybe five in an extended Multi-clogs. stay. Yeah, sure. So the question is, would bringing your own toilet paper have any effect on that at all? It might bring that number down, but it still leaves you in a circumstance where you're, you're clogging things up. The answer here might be be to bring your own plunger that's a not a particularly easy thing to travel with i mean amazon has to have a retractable version somewhere for like you know 9.99 on prime okay so short of bring your own plunger or simply buying in-laws a really top-notch elite plunger right you could be more efficient with the toilet paper, which is not a great ask, Ty. No. I'm going to be honest. It's not a great ask. Yeah. Rationing you could, your toilet paper is difficult. It's it's tough. You could start figuring out the timing of your daily schedule. Say you go out for breakfast all the time. Maybe you have an early coffee knowing you will be at a different facility at around 10 a.m. Okay, right, right. So you're, you're talking a little co-location situation here. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. It's just sort of timing some sort of caffeine intake or, you know, a catalyst that if you can time it right, that you don't have to worry about the plumbing there. If you're if you know you're going to a park, if you, I know park's not the greatest place, but right. if you're going somewhere, you're going to a bookstore, you always go into town at this hour, you always do the, whatever and just sort of adjusting your timing if that's on the table. I would also say eat less roughage, less fiber. Just mm. Offer less to a the, lot of, to the a gods. Lot of cheese. Yeah. Or eat a bunch of nuts. That'll stop you up. Yeah. But I, I'd never advocate people slowing down. I'm a job creator, Ty. I keep that factory moving. And so yeah. I will never advocate people slowing down the metab. So that's what I would say at this point. But I don't think there's anything wrong with bringing your own TP. That's your Movantic moment. If you are downstairs and you have to go kind of badly and you're portable tp is upstairs yeah it, it's easy to forget you have your eyes on the prize it's easy to forget that you brought your own customizable tp situation if so. you brought your own would you tell the in-laws i feel like that's an odd conversation to have no but here is a situation i've been in my one of my younger brother's former fiance's family. Okay. So it's his very difficult to follow, but I think so I his would be in-laws and it didn't work out, have a very old home and it's a nice home, but it's very old. And the plumbing is such that I think the pipes are particularly thin. So they tell people when they are in the house or about to use the bathroom or staying with them, like, Hey, if you have to go to the bathroom, don't use a lot. And they have to have that conversation with everybody. Wow. So I've been there. Wow. It's not great. Okay. Um, so that's that's the best I can do. Your own TP. How yeah. long, Brother Mazone, yeah. reference to the wire, how long would you need to be dating somebody before pooping in his or her bathroom, knowing okay, they okay. would smell it? Okay, okay. Ty? Wow. I don't think there's any one right answer. No, no. It obviously, but I would, it obviously depends on the level of urgency. Um, you have to have some sort of idea, and I think everybody in some sense does, have some sort of idea of how potent the ceiling of the, the potency, what's yeah. coming. 
And I would I would judge in that way. This is where you need to develop a very good courtesy flush. Yes. That's what the courtesy flush was invented for. I would also do some scouting of is there some sort of freshener? Is there a Febreze situation already in yeah. his or her bathroom? Matches something, yeah. Right. Yeah. Be ready yeah. to go with something like that very quickly. Um, we did get one another one here from Al. He says, three urinals, two men, no one should be at the middle, correct? Yeah, that's correct. That's a no-brainer. Unless there's something particularly heinous in one of the the side urinals. But yes, I, I think you're fine. What, like a human head? What wouldn't... Yes. I, I don't see any explanation for going in that middle one. Well, sometimes urinals can be stopped up and kind of gross. I think you, almost, I I think you go stall. You, uh, I, I think that's right. All right. Um, Brushing your teeth in the bathroom at work. Okay or gross. That comes to us from old pal Quinn. I can't do it, Dan. My brother does this here at this office. Regularly? Yes, every day after lunch. No. Yeah, 100% true. Your brother is a little weird. You said he's He's all about weird. dental hygiene. Oh, yeah. Everybody here is a little bit weird. True. I mean, if you've got a dentist appointment, then yeah, I get that. If you've got something stuck in your teeth, if, it, if it's an emergency, I understand the need to keep the keep the portable toothbrush handy in case you got a big meeting or ate something with a lot of onions. I get that. I do. Uh, I've never done it. It sort of grosses me out a little bit. Why? It just does. It just does. If it's my own bathroom at home, it's different. I can control the cleanliness of it. Right. But in a public facility where I'm not sure, no, it's just not for me. Okay. I think it's fine. I think it's just people taking their dental hygiene seriously, and I feel more ashamed that I'm not as serious about my teeth than they are. Let's go two or three more very quickly. Okay. How about Brian? Brian. Okay. My wife and I moved into our condo about a year and a half ago. Unknowingly, when setting up the living room, I created a situation with a slightly with a slight ajar of our bathroom door. I have a perfect line of sight to the TV. Oh, nice. This is a thinking man right here, Brian. My question is, when is it appropriate to use the, the door as slightly ajar to see the TV from my toilet? I would say never, ever, ever. Really? So he, he's yes. he's basically saying that he has inadvertently created a situation where if he leaves the door slightly ajar, yeah, he can see his TV. Mm -hmm. Plenty of situations arise during college football season. Um, uh, okay. due, due to the dawn of the DVR. Yeah. And every game streaming on your iPad and your phone. Right. Yeah. It, you can probably bypass the need for this in a way that you couldn't five to ten years ago right but still on a live sporting event type situate i can see i can see pulling it off for that that's i would say sense. outfit your phone or tablet with some sort of streaming app if it's live sports if not there's enough to entertain you i people aren't going to be in there for 25 minutes if they're rushing to get back to something what if his wife's not home you're still polluting everything Ty. Nah, do whatever you want yeah yeah now you got the waves coming all right. Um, we got a bunch of questions here as it relates to <laughs> troughs in the men's bathroom. Yeah. This seems to be a thing. Somebody made this decision. Yeah. Probably around the time they invented the cotton gin that mm -hmm. a pee trough would be a good idea in men's facilities, Dan. A lot of questions Oof. around what is the strategy for uh, for using the trough. I try to avoid it at all costs. Yeah. I would say don't drink any liquids for two hours and during any sort of sporting event. <laughs> The ultimate test of this is, uh, it just comes to the top of my mind because I went to Penn State, mm -hmm. but up at State College, the saloon, which is a popular location, used to have a trough situation. I don't know if they still do. Right. Used to have a trough situation. And I could remember the apprehension amongst my friends and I, uh, knowing that we were there to consume a reasonable amount of liquid and um, that the trough situation is what awaited. So in a lot of situations, we would use saloon as the initial location, go there early, hit there for happy hour, and then, you know, either hit your apartment afterwards or go somewhere else to get a little bit more privacy. Right. I'm not a fan of the trough. Yeah, it's the worst. Ty, when is it appropriate, if ever, to use the handicap stall? Oh. If you are yourself not differently able. I'm not a fan of this, Dan. I'm not a fan of it. I feel I feel like I am breaking my moral compass by 
by utilizing it. So generally speaking, the the handicap stall, a higher throne, I believe. Yep. And and more spacious Correct. to accommodate like a wheelchair or something. Right. So I would say if we're talking office or a business of you know you're at a Barnes and Noble or something at an office or a busy business during peak hours or during office hours avoid unless i would say there is a caveat unless you are almost positive nobody in your office if you have a smaller office needs to use it because of a physical ailment or uh is around that day or something like that and if you've got some sort of, you know how Phil Jackson sat on that special chair because he had no. like a million different back and whatever hip issues. Sure. If you've got, I don't know if it makes you handicapped. It probably doesn't. But if you got like a terrible, terrible back and for whatever reason, that's more comfortable for you. I think I'm morally okay with it. If you are at the office at an off hour, if you have a late meeting and you're one of three people still at the office at 844 PM, go ahead and use it. Okay. Would you never use it? No, I don't use it. Well, I don't think that would be a reason for me to. Sometimes when, if I'm at the airport at like 5 a.m. and I've got a bunch of luggage and it's just easier in the in that stall, I might go for it. I think for the most part, it's kind of an irrational fear. Sure. It's not usually that heavily used, but um, it's just a mental thing. I don't know. Sure. Um, another one here, kind of along the same lines. We'll do this one and one more, okay? Okay. Someone asked for the etiquette, and is there like a a line length, any situation in which using the opposite bathroom Mm -hmm. is acceptable, or what is the strategy for using the opposite bathroom? Right. So you're a guy, long line, girl's bathroom's open, you decide to make, make the move, try and get in there and out. I think it's only acceptable if you have pre screened to see what the situation is there. Like if it's not heavily trafficked then it's okay. Uh, And also, if you can have someone stand guard, that would be ideal. If you have a sentry at the gate, that would be ideal. I probably just wouldn't. Yeah. I probably just wouldn't, just to avoid any any sort of problematic situations that could arise. Over under, Ty. Toilet paper. Hmm. Which direction do you skew? Uh, I'm not heavily in favor of one over the other. Oh, okay. I used to be an under. I thought it was more aesthetically nice. Yeah. But now I'm an over because... I'm usually over. I think I'm an over because I just... Why would I want something touching the walls? I don't need particles. I'm good. So All right. Go so so here's the deal. We've got one yeah. left. And I want to try and actually help someone with this uh, with this show. We've got a lot of questions here. So my thought mm-hmm. is that because we've been doing one of these per month because it's a long off season... Uh, we should save these. We should share this doc out, and we should we should save sure. these and use them moving forward. Maybe sprinkle a few in here and there. But um, we got one from a gentleman who's going to be living in a house with eight guys. Yeah. All right. This is from Michael. He says, um, next year, I'm living with eight other guys, so nine guys in total, mm-hmm. in a house with only two bathrooms. He says, at least there are four showers. Any general tips or advice? <sighs> so... If becoming an early riser is an option, <laughs> I'd go with that uh, for the household itself. I would also start scouting out if you are in college and you're going to be on campus, figure out a super under trafficked bathroom that's on campus somewhere. I think we all have figured out where that is. Ty, did you remember? Did you have a bathroom on Penn State's campus? I did. Yeah, I did. Where was it? In the uh, the Hetzel Union building, a.k.a. the hub. Okay, mine was in the EMU, also the uh, the yeah. Union Building. Sure, and it was on the floor where the radio station was, which you needed like a passcode to get into. Very the door. smart, it's very smart, Dan. So very it smart. was. It smelled a little bit like cinnamon. It was wonderful. Do you have a so secret? Was, do you have a secret bathroom at your current job? I don't, but we have the uh, the individual ones. Oh, okay. so it's not as needed. Here's. Somebody else asked this question, and I I feel like it's sort of adjacent to this topic. Um, Will you be strategic? Will you use different floors if you're going to to have a lengthier stay? So in our old building, we used to be in Midtown. Now we're downtown in New York, in Manhattan. In our old building, we had the 8th, 9th, 10th, and 14th floor. 
and I worked on the ninth floor. And I would sometimes go to the eighth floor for lengthier stays, whatever. But apparently the 10th floor was super popular among people because that floor was like 90% women, at least. So the men's room was a ghost town. Right. So people would go up there specifically to have some privacy. What I guess the people that went up there didn't realize was that the people working in the office, there was glass doors, you go in, whatever. All of the women that worked for those, you know, the, the office that was on the 10th floor could see people getting off the elevator and getting coming onto the floor and they would come into the office so they wouldn't, whatever. And they realized anybody that came up to the 10th floor that didn't walk into the office area was dropping a load. <laughs> That's They were just like, so we could just chart people's schedules. In trying to be less obvious, everybody was indeed <laughs> alerting a lot of people that it was time. This has been a very productive discussion, Dan. Absolutely, Ty. Absolutely. I love that. Email Um, us at solidverbal at gmail.com with more. mm -hmm. We will promise to uh, sprinkle a few of these in uh, as best we can throughout the course of the the next couple weeks here. I'm still thinking about the the dating thing, Ty. There are some people who won't do it at all. I know married people won't do it. Yeah. Email us, solidverbal at gmail.com. Subscribe. Find us on social media. We got a bunch of other great questions that um, I think we want to get to in due yep. time here. And uh, I promise we will. So keep on sending them in. We read all the emails. We do our best to try and get through as many of them as we can. Uh, we'll be back next week. Talks more college football. Again, tell your friends. Solidable.com yep. is the website. For that guy over there, Dan Rubenstein. For myself, Ty Hildebrandt, thanks again for tuning in. Solid Verbal. Catch you all in a week. Stay solid. Peace.